This is Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Follow on Twitter. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Spread it like this. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. We Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. Welcome to Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. And this is episode 695. Thanks for joining us. Check out our previous episodes, MarkingOut.com. Give us a listen over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you may be listening to the podcast. Also, give us a five-star rating and give us a kind very, very kind review. Go buy a t-shirt over at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Markin' Out. Give us a like over on Facebook. Give us a follow over on Instagram at Markin' Out 11. And also on TikTok and on Twitter at Markin' Out. But I am Dave, the Rave. And you can check me out on all social media platforms at David PTD, PT. You can follow Chris at Chris Sween Dog over on Twitter and CM Sweeney85 on Instagram. And also check out Brandon at BTTG161. That being said, with the introduction, I am going to send on over to Brandon. Brandon, how are you? I am doing awesome as always. How about yourself? Doing fantastic. Exhausted. Exhausted. Ready for sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Ready for sleep. I bet. How was your week? My week was incredible. Um, took an Amtrak down to Baltimore to meet some friends for a wedding. Uh, it, it was a beautiful reception. It was a great time. Then got to explore a little bit of the Baltimore Harbor. And... Took the Amtrak back up, got delayed by like an, like I think it was delayed by like thirty minutes, but then because it, it started downpouring, and then when I got back, it was like, let's see, I got onto I got the twelve sixteen a.m. Long Island Railroad, uh, and I got on that, and it actually stalled. It lost power for like I think it was probably fifteen to thirty minutes, on the track, Jeez. so. Yeah, so that was lovely. So I had work the next day, so I was exhausted. But overall, it was such an amazing, amazing weekend. What about you? Well, I wasn't feeling too great last week, and I got chicken soup from a diner, which was just okay. And then I got chicken soup from Panera by Ways of BJ's. And I just thought it was gross. I don't like Panera at all. They have one mm-hmm. good thing on their menu. It's the kitchen sink cookie, and that's it. What's that? Just everything in there? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, no nuts, though. I think I don't know what specifically there is, but it's literally one of the best cookies I've ever had. But mm-hmm. I did the only thing that I knew I could do, and I made my own chicken soup. By the time we recorded last week, I was already better. And by the time I made this the chicken soup, I was already better. But I made the soup. It was really good. It's always really good when I make it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I took the chicken from that and made chicken salad, which was also good. So that's really, that's the only thing I really did this week. There was a ton of professional wrestling that I watched. Yeah, there was a lot taking place. Kicking off with King and Queen of the Ring. Taking place in Saudi Arabia. Um, definitely love the presentation that they did. Yeah, and it was cool for SmackDown. I said last week's episode, it was cool that they had like a WrestleMania feel to it as, as well. Yeah, I agree. It, it was really nice. WWE Speed also has that this week. Mm, yeah, that's But true. King and Queen of the Ring kicked off. With Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill picking up the victory over the way to retain the tag team championships. This was added pretty much last minute. I picked the champions for both of us. Yeah. Because I didn't think you'd be picking the way. <laughs> uh, no, there was no way that I was picking the way. 
And obviously in this match, Bianca Belair had to work with uh, a knee that wasn't even close to 100%. And the way worked on that knee. Hmm. I didn't think the end of the match was going to be the end of the match because it kind of, it was like a series of tag moves by the champions. And then that was the ending. I thought it was a great series of tag moves, but I, it was just kind of like out of nowhere for me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm a fan that Jade and Bianca Belair have matching moves, matching gear and everything. So I'm, I'm pumped for this team. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the WrestleMania stuff, they didn't match. But uh, no, they definitely matched at WrestleMania. Did they? Did they? I don't. For some reason, I feel like they didn't for my memory. But also at my old age, memory is questionable. So um, I'm almost certain. Did they? I, I have to look back. Yeah, at them, they, but... they did. They wore well. Naomi wore gold. Jade Cargill wore silver, and Bianca Belair wore gold and silver. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, but Cargill and Belair, I think definitely there was no way that they were losing to the way, Um, but happy that they picked up the victory. Next up, you had Liv Morgan successfully defeat Becky Lynch to become the new champion. Um, Huge, huge shocker. On the kickoff show. Dominic Mysterio interrupted Liv Morgan's interview and said that he's there to make sure that she doesn't win Rhea Ripley's title. And I thought Liv Morgan and and Becky Lynch were having a pretty good match, but all I kept thinking and waiting for was when Dominic Mysterio is going to show up. Mm -hmm. And when Becky Lynch had that disarmor locked in, Dominic showed up, which distracted Becky Lynch she yelled at him and then Dominic slid Becky Lynch a chair as if she's going to be the one to cheat (laughs) and it was behind the referee's back and when the referee was distracted with that with uh with Dominic Liv Morgan ends up DDTing Becky Lynch onto the chair and then she hit oblivion to pick up that victory so It's funny that it was Dominic saying that he's going to do anything he can to prevent it. Shows up to help Becky Lynch cheat. And then ultimately cost her the match. And then Becky Lynch later on, they caught up. uh, Byron Saxton caught up with Becky Lynch. and She had just been yelling at Dominic Mysterio about what happened. And then she said she has a rematch clause. Which we'll put a pin in. Yeah, big pin in that one because that was the... uh... The talk of the town. But I enjoyed uh, that match. Yeah, I think that was an enjoyable match. I think that, I, I honestly, I wasn't expecting too much from the matchup itself, but I, I, I enjoyed it. Next up, you had Sami Zayn pick up the victory over Chad Gable and Bronson Reed to retain the championship. Um, I like the ankle lock spot, uh, spot that they had. Yeah, I like that. The crowd was hot for this match. Mm-hmm. I liked Chad Gable using the apron, the, the ring apron to, or not the ring apron, the ring skirt to beat Sami Zayn, hold him with it like Finley used to do. Mm-hmm. I really liked when uh, Bronson Reed, he missed that moonsault to Sami Zayn, and then Chad Gable hit that moonsault on Bronson Reed. I thought that was good. And then the ankle lock spot, like you mentioned, where he broke up the pin by locking Sami Zayn in the ankle. Mm-hmm. Um, Chad Gable at one point he saw Bronson Reed or in that that series of ankle locks he saw Bronson Reed coming over and uh, locked him in one and then Sami Zayn locked Chad Gable in that ankle lock at the same time which uh, it was I've not I don't think I've seen something like that before Ooh, that I don't remember either and then uh, we saw a nice spot with the German suplex where it looked like Bronson Reed would hit the German suplex on Sami Zayn where Sami would then hit it on Chad Gable. But Gable got out of it, hit the German suplex on Bronson Reed who in turn hits it on on Sami Zayn. But the match basically starts to fall apart for Chad Gable when he called for Otis's help. And Otis, at first, he knocks down Bronson Reed 
And then Chad Gable had him do it for Sami Zayn as well, except Otis was very conflicted here. And Chad Gable picked Sami Zayn up and Otis was still not doing it. Chad Gable forces him, basically. He keeps yelling at Otis to do it. He pushed Otis. He slapped Otis. And then Otis goes and hits the clothesline, except Sami Zayn moved and he hit Chad Gable. And then Sami Zayn got in the ring, hit the halufa kick on uh, on Bronson Reed to pick up the victory. So I thought that was a good finish there to keep it where Athlete. Otis is t- very torn on what he's doing here. Yeah, I mean, something to add to it is I'm happy that Chad Gable wasn't the one that was pinned. Yeah. Or tapped out. Yeah. You know, I think that it was a smart involvement of Bronson Reed. Plus, I feel like the involvement of Bronson Reed really does elevate the title defense of Sami Zayn with him beating Bronson Reed because Bronson Reed is a a powerful mountain of a man. Yeah, as we learned on Monday Night Raw, he could bench press 600 pounds. Yeah, so... Both him and Otis. After that, we saw Nia Jax pick up the victory over Lyra Valkyria to become the queen of the ring. Lyra's entrance I thought was dope. But Nia Jax controlled a lot of this match. And I liked at one point, Nia Jax went for the Annihilator the first time. Lyra Valkyria moved to the apron. So Nia Jax repositioned herself and then did the Annihilator on the apron. She missed it, but I think it was still cool to see. Mm-hmm. Like a complete reposition of that where she climbed out of the ring to do it. I, I thought that was really good. But Nia Jax did eventually go for it again. Lyra Valkyria kicks out Nia's legs. And uh, actually used her NXT UK finisher here. Which I wish she would continue to use. I don't know if she's going to. Maybe now that she's on a different brand uh, than Carmelo Hayes, she might. But, uh, or, yeah, Lyra, yeah, she's on Raw. He's on SmackDown. May, I, I'm more of a fan of that finisher for her than anything else she's used. But Nia Jax went for the Samoan drop from the middle rope. Lyra Valkyria tried to turn that into a powerbomb. But Nia Jax hit one hell of an annihilator to pick up the victory there. I thought that was a great finish. Yeah. Initially, I I was disappointed because I was really hoping for Lyra Valkyria to win that queen of the ring but uh, Nia Jax since she's been back has worked her ass off and I, I just thought this match was so well done yeah I I definitely agree with what you what you just said I think that Nia Jax has been I don't care what anybody else has said she's been phenomenal since she's been back with the WWE yeah, 100% um, especially since I mean not and I'm not talking like Royal Rumble but back full time with WWE she's been just phenomenal uh, doing what she's been doing. She's been acting as a powerhouse backstage and at ringside. And I think that in the ring, uh, she has been doing her job perfectly. On the mic, she's been doing really well. Yeah. So I got I have no no disputes of Nia Jax being the queen of the ring. And I think that I think that with Nia Jax as queen of the ring, as opposed to Lyra Valkyria, I think there is more storyline and more that can come for Nia Jax being queen of the ring versus Lyra Valkyria being queen of the ring. I don't see it as more Mm -hmm. because right now we know Nia Jax gets a guaranteed title shot at SummerSlam. So it could have very much so been a huge elevation for Lyra Valkyria. So either or I'm fine with the outcome though, but Triple H came out afterwards to present Nia Jax with the crown that was, uh, I believe Nia Jax cut a promo as well. And then we go to the King of the Ring finals where Gunter picks up the victory over Randy Orton to become King of the Ring. The fans, like you wanted, sang Randy Orton's theme song and he was completely over with that crowd. The match itself for me was pretty slow. Fans just like the whole time going nuts for it though. Yeah, I think that I, I love the reaction that Randy Orton is getting. Um, it's just, fan- it's fantastic. And let's face it, he deserves it. I, I don't dispute that. And I hate to say this, but I wasn't really into this match like okay. at all. Mm-hmm. 
Gunther, we saw him hit a splash, and he went for a second one. Randy Orton moved out of the way for that. He hits an RKO, but because his back, he it was it, we, he couldn't go for the cover right away. And when he finally got to Gunther, Gunther rolls out of the ring, and I thought that was a really good spot. Mm-hmm. So I shouldn't say I wasn't into it at all because there were little pieces of it where I was like, obviously that's a brilliant spot. I also I liked when Randy Orton sold his knee. Because both Randy Orton and uh, and Bianca Belair went into the, the semifinals with, with hurt knees. True. Randy Orton goes into the final with a hurt knee. And here he is selling his, his hurt knee and his hurt back at the same time. Mm-hmm. Which Gunther, Gunther worked throughout the whole match. Yeah, I think that uh, the mentality of Gunther in the matchups. And I, I think that his ring, I don't, what is it? Not ring awareness, but... Just his presence and his presentation of his ring abilities with knowing what body part to work on, how to work the crowd, how to work his opponents, how to make them look good and look bad. Uh, I think that Gunther has been phenomenal. But also selling-wise, I think if you're a pro wrestler, up and coming, or whatever level you're at, I think that's a very good match to study Randy Orton with. Yeah. In regards to selling, because... He's literally selling two different injuries at the same time, and it looks like both injuries hurt him. Mm-hmm. Randy Orton did hit another RKO, and then Gunther rolled Randy Orton into a pin to to pick up the victory. Yeah. Orton's shoulder was up, so that sucked, but Triple H commented on it later on and said that uh, the referee's decision is final, and... Perhaps we will see Gunther versus Randy Orton again someday. Yeah, and I think it's, um, I think that that's really good that they did have Triple H address this too. Yeah, I thought that that was really, really good. And they did say I think Randy Orton got injured during this matchup as well. I'm not a hundred percent sure, yeah. but I guess I mean his back and his knee. Yeah, yeah. But then when when Gunther was interviewed afterwards, I thought it was all hilarious. The the fans were chanting, you deserve it. And Gunther shuts them down like right away and they started booing the hell out of him. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then they announced that Crown Jewel will be uh, November 2nd in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. This was in Jeddah. Uh, After that, Triple H had an announcement. He announced that Drew McIntyre has been cleared and Damian Priest agreed to defend the championship against him at Clash of the Castle in Glasgow, Scotland for a second when Triple H had that big announcement because they sold it as such. I thought they were about to say <laughs> Priest and, and McIntyre were going on that card. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? There's no way. Like, one match is left. They're just going to randomly add a championship match, but it's going to be taking place in... in Scotland as we all expected it to and then the main event saw Cody Rhodes pick up the victory over Logan Paul to retain the WWE Championship Logan Paul kept getting the upper hand over things that I feel like he shouldn't against someone like Cody Rhodes so maybe this was Cody Rhodes underestimating Logan Paul um I don't know I don't know if it would necessarily be underestimating too much. Because I feel like they were simple things that somebody of Cody's stature should have, like, had under wraps, perhaps? I don't know. It's maybe. Unless Logan Paul is just that damn good is what the I'd, story is. I'd say Logan Paul is that damn good because you had Cody Rhodes say a few times that he respects like that he recognizes Logan Paul and what he's accomplished. Yeah, but so he far. also says that until Logan Paul changes, he's not going to he's not going to be a, a superstar or something like that. Mhm. I forget what the exact quote was, something about a part-timer or so so that could be an underestimation of Cody Rhodes there, so True, true. I I do want to say that I'll say it now, but a mark out moment was that frog splash, but the camera angle of that frog splash. Which is something that Logan Paul pitched uh, last year, I believe it was. Yeah, I think that that's incredible. The entire full, uh, the full 360, 360 view around him. I thought that that was awesome. 
before that spot, we saw somebody in a prime shirt get into it with Cody Rhodes. And when he was dealing with that, someone else gave Logan Paul brass knuckles. And then Logan used them on Cody. And Logan Paul and Michael Cole got into it. And Logan Paul went to go over to get into Michael Cole's face. And Corey Graves stood up to block him. And then Cody ends up hitting Logan Paul with the the suicide dive. I'm wondering, probably not, but what are the odds of Michael Cole versus Logan Paul taking place ever? I can't see that happening. I don't know. That was a I, big that was a big part of this match where Logan Paul said he wasn't going to use the brass knuckles. He gave the brass knuckles to Michael Cole and then the next night at that uh on SmackDown there's brass knuckles in his pocket. Oh, I wasn't going to use them at the pay-per-view though, the PLE. And then fast forward, Michael Cole has the brass knuckles and then magically more brass knuckles appear. Mhm. So, I don't know, but I liked uh, Logan Paul ended up using the the crossroads later on in the match. He went to pedigree Cody Rhodes on the commentary table, but Cody got out of that and went to the barricade, hit a Cody cutter on the table. Almost won via countout. And he made the referee stop counting. And then we saw Logan Paul knock Cody Rhodes out, put him on that commentary table, like you said, for that frog splash, but... Logan Paul picked Cody Rhodes up to get him into the ring. He hit another frog splash and Cody Rhodes kicked out. And then Logan Paul accidentally whipped Cody into the referee. The referee goes down. Logan accidentally splashes the referee. And Logan Paul low blows Cody Rhodes. He puts the brass knuckles on again to use them again. And Ibrahim al Hajij the comedian that was the guest ring announcer for this grabs Logan Paul's legs, which allowed for Cody to to hit the trifecta and pick up that victory. I thought that this match was definitely exceeded my expectations. I thought it was really good. It's, I mean, when he faced Roman Reigns in, in Saudi Arabia, it was exceeding expectations. Mm -hmm. Very well done. Yeah. Big time. Moving over to Monday night raw. It opened with Gunther, where he put Damian Priest over, and then he said the King of the Ring tournament was lacking prestige, so he had to be the one that stepped up. And he said the World Heavyweight Championship is also lacking prestige because Damian Priest won by taking a shortcut, alluding to the Money in the Bank cash-in. And then the Judgment Day came out, and Damian Priest said everyone saw that Gunther didn't actually win the match. Mm -hmm. And they went back and forth, and then Drew McIntyre showed up. And he addressed CM Punk because the fans were chanting it. And he said if it wasn't for him, CM Punk would would probably have screwed up again and been fired and, and, and had nowhere else to go. Obviously alluding to <laughs> everything that took place in AEW. Yeah. And then he turned his attention to Damian Priest and he told him that he needs to focus on himself and he needs his championship again. And then he named a few wrestlers from the United Kingdom, like William Regal, like British Bulldog, like Finley. And he said all of those wrestlers have something in common. They are all looked at as these legends, but none of them have won the WWE Championship like he has done. Mm -hmm. And then he brought up how the fans are going to destroy Damian Priest in, in Scotland. And they're going to get into Damian Priest's head. And Priest brought up Drew McIntyre's wife just to get under his skin and, and show him, like, I could do the same thing you're doing. And then Braun Strowman showed up. And Strowman went face to face with Damian Priest. He looked at the championship he had a match with J.D. McDonough, so that's what that was there for. I don't know, maybe at Money in the Bank we could possibly see Damian Priest versus Braun Strowman or something. I don't know. I mm, I don't know when Money in the Bank is at this point. I don't know if we're going to... I 
Huh. I don't know if we're going to end up with... I guess maybe. I feel like like everything with Braun is leading him to deeper with Judgment Day. I can't see him directly going after Damian Priest so fast. But maybe he has a feud with Finn Balor. I mean, J.D. McDonough right now. Because yeah, but... if... If... I mean, we have Clash of the Castle coming up next. Drew McIntyre has to win or no? Hmm. And then we get maybe Drew McIntyre versus uh, CM Punk at Money in the Bank? Honestly, I, w- I would want him to. So maybe we can see something like that at, at Money in the Bank where it's obviously no no title involved. Braun Strowman versus Damian Priest. Yeah, I would definitely want to. SummerSlam? I don't know what SummerSlam. Gunther versus Drew McIntyre then. Or mm-hmm. Gunther versus CM Punk. Hmm. Unless that That'd... money in the bank is not... I don't know. That's what I need to... I need more information to fill in blanks. Yeah, there's so much that could happen. Because you know? at the end of August, after SummerSlam, is Bash in Berlin. You're going to tell me they're going to Germany that... that Gunther's not going to be WWE champion or not WWE champion, world heavyweight champion. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's tough to call anything, but, but Strowman picked up the victory over McDonough, which I think this match went on way too long, Mm -hmm. but Finn Balor got involved and, and Braun Strowman dropped him. And when the referee was dealing with that, Carlito came out and he got Braun. And Braun was distracted with that momentarily, so J.D. McDonough was able to take over for a quick second. But Braun Strowman shuts that down, and then the Judgment Day, after the match, jumped Braun. He took them all out, and J.D. McDonough used a chair which had almost no effect on him. It was one of those, like, whoops. Probably shouldn't have done that spots. Braun Strowman, though, was limping. So I don't know if I didn't see any like updates on Braun Strowman or anything. Yeah, I didn't see anything about uh, an injury. And he continued to chase JD McDonough. And at one point, even we saw JD McDonough talking to Liv Morgan in the background of uh, Sheamus, I believe it was. And Braun Strowman shows up and he's still limping. And we saw later on Damian Priest. He addressed that that spot with J.D. McDonough and Liv Morgan and J.D. was just saying like, oh, I was saying, oh, you're not going to get the title or something like that. I forget what exactly he said. And then Damian Priest told Carlito to leave the clubhouse. Mm -hmm. You're not in Judgment Day. Get out of here, basically. And then Dominic Mysterio showed up and Damian Priest was annoyed because he helped, basically helped Liv Morgan take that championship. And Dominic Mysterio said he told Rhea that he's going to fix it which we'll put a pin in. Yeah. Next up, we had Dragonoff pick of the victory over Ricochet. Uh, something about Dragonoff's entrance is just incredible. Yeah. Something, like, I just love his entrance, his, his charisma, and everything with that entrance, and just awesome. This but, was a match Ricochet wanted to have against Braun, Braun Breaker. Mm-hmm. But Adam Pierce said that Braun Breaker, it, well, he was fined for what he did last week, and he's not there. He's at home. Mm-hmm. And then Ilya Dragunov basically thanked him for pushing him out of the way and said, when you're healed up, we can go again. And Ricochet was like, oh, well, what do you know? I am I was just cleared by the doctors, and Adam Pierce made the match. I thought the match was fun. The super kick counter uh, to counter the H bomb, I thought was a really nice spot from the, the top rope. I think storyline wise, it wasn't smart for Ricochet to take this match because his ribs seemed like they were hurt the whole time. It didn't seem like he was cleared, even though we just heard the doctors say he was cleared. Yeah, they cleared him, but maybe they cleared him a little bit too soon. And then when Ricochet hit that shooting star press. He gets up from that. Braun Breaker shows up out of nowhere, a million miles per hour, spears him, and then Ilya Dragunov got up and started to chop him, but Braun Breaker speared him as well, and the fans ate it up. You would think that's like something they would boo at, but they're eating it up, and maybe this this version of Braun Breaker is better than Wolf Dogs at this point. I don't know. I 
I would agree with you. There's, I mean, on my end, there's no, I don't know. It's, yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I keep on watching these video clips of, yeah, he's so over with the crowd right now. And just seeing the clips of the different angles of Braun Breaker getting into the ring. I mean, did you see yeah, the I mean, overhead yeah, clip? He's crawling in the crowd and then hops the barricade with ease, he, gets in the ring, boom, does a spot. I mean, it's just... There Genetic was no, freak? There was just no delay. I mean, how he was crawling in the no. crowd and then... That that leap over the barricade, it was just flawless. It, he's a genetic freak. He just leaped right over the barricade, just scaled it like he did parkour, and gets right into the ring with a perfect setup of Ricochet just looking at him at the right time and getting rocked with the spear. He has to be top maybe two athletes in WWE right now. I mean, I I was very impressed with, with that. I know, like, I've I've had... Um, I've said it on the show many times about how Braun, Bra- Braun Breaker has to win me over, and this definitely is starting to win me over. I watched that spot uh, maybe five times in a row. Mm-hmm. And if, I, if I'm scrolling through Twitter and I happen to see it again, I'll watch it. It was a good spot. It was. After that, we saw the awesome truth outside. They had a Memorial Day ice cream truck, uh, and our truth had organized a Memorial Day raffle for a title shot which Miz didn't, I think, know about. And Karrion Cross interrupted New Day here and said that he wants to help Xavier Woods get to the top, which sets up a match for them next week. Then we yeah. saw Authors of Pain pick up the victory over the Creeds in another time. I think we would have seen the Creeds get an obvious win over ALP here, but... Yeah, I'd agree. Like a, a, an NXT time. Or even... Yeah, maybe, perhaps. But now I'm just I'm thinking we're going to probably see them... Maybe this will lead to them like... We're losers, we need help. Chad Gable is here. That's true, too. I mean, that would follow up with everything that we saw in the uh, backstage se- segment last Monday Night Raw. Yeah. Yeah. Authors of Pain, by the way, they have a new finisher. It's a uh, a suplex neckbreaker powerbomb called Water Rush. I think that's pretty cool. Mm. But after that, we saw Sheamus uh, basically saying that he can't wait to get his hands on Ludwig Kaiser. And Kaiser was on the screen. He interrupted and said that Guther is actually to blame for Sheamus losing his King of the Ring qualifier because it's Guther. Nobody stands a chance against Guther. And then Sheamus went to the back looking for Kaiser, and Kaiser jumped Sheamus, which was broken up. I mean, I I love the fact that Sheamus went looking for him. Let's not skip over a little something something backstage. Though. I don't know if I mean there. I assume you're talking about quote unquote Alexa Bliss. Yeah. Nobody I mean, knows if it was actually Alexa Bliss or not, though. Exactly. Nobody knows. Watch. It was just. It was just somebody. It on could one hundred percent have just been an extra. I don't know what. Oh, it it one hundred percent could have been an extra. It could have been somebody on production. It could have been anybody. But it just so happens when Sheamus goes chasing him down backstage. At one point, he turns a corner, and there's just somebody standing there that's blonde with what looks like to be her fiend attire, just. Standing there, it didn't like the person didn't move, didn't react, didn't say anything. Wasn't I don't think it's through. fiend attire, I just think it's it was just striped pants. Well, it looked like the pants that she had, I think, at WrestleMania the skirt with um, the stripes. Not sure. Um, they were but pants that she on Monday Night Raw, though, yeah. But, but all the, the QR codes and everything, the, the Twitch streams, the WhatsApp, and everything, I think, have been great, getting more and, and more creepy. Yeah, very much so, and all signs right now point to June 17th, Monday Night Raw, perhaps? So that means that June 17th, you gotta be watching Monday Night Raw. After that, we saw Lyra Valkyria pick up the the victory over Kyrie Sane. Kyrie has a new theme song, which I don't actually hate. I would just prefer for her old theme song to be there, because that was literally one of the best theme songs in WWE history. Mm Mm-hmm. But Becky Lynch spoke to Lyra Valkyria before this match and, and just said that things at, at the, the the PLE didn't go their way. And it's not about winning all the time. It's about getting better. So you either win 
or learn until it's time to walk away. And as far as this match goes, I think Lyra and Kyrie both needed the victory here. Kyrie hasn't won a singles match in WWE since July 2020. No way, stop. Well, I mean, she hasn't been she's she came back in November. She hasn't had that many singles matches, so it's not like that far. I don't know. That, that that is that is a bit wild. But she hasn't had that many singles matches, but I think both of them very much so Needed a victory. Lyra Valkyria, I think more so because she just lost one of the biggest matches of her career. Mm -hmm. But we saw Lyra Valkyria reverse the insane elbow to roll up Kyrie Sane. And then backstage, Io was pissed off. And she broke a ton of furniture, lamps and tables. Yeah, she was furious. I mean, she gave that like axe kick right through the table. Yeah, so where that leads with uh, damage control, we'll find out I'm sure next week. After that, we saw Rey Mysterio pick up the victory over Carlito, which was a match for the first time in 20 years that they faced off one-on-one on WWE television. Yeah, I think that that's incredible. That's been so long, and nothing for nothing, but you take it back 20 years, this match could have been 20 years ago. It, they didn't miss a beat. They, were, uh, they did wrestle, I think it was in 2017, for another promotion, and they did wrestle... Dark matches, I want to say like 19 years ago, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then obviously they were involved in, in, I think, tag matches. But Finn Balor jumped Dragon Lee during this and Rey Mysterio took Finn Balor out. And then the Judgment Day came out and they took Rey Mysterio and Dragon Lee out. Rey came back for a hot second, but Damian Priest shut that down, so... Maybe we will see Carlito join the Judgment Day. But yeah, like you said, it it literally could have been 2004 as if no time has passed between Rey Mysterio and Carlito or for them, I should say. Mm -hmm. After that, Bronson Reed picked up the victory over Otis. We saw backstage Chad Gable spoke to Alpha Academy and he was annoyed that, A, he was annoyed that Akira Tozawa wasn't at, at King and Queen of the Ring. And he was annoyed with Alpha Academy because he could have used them. And he was annoyed at Maxine. And then he blamed Otis for not being champion right now because he knocked him down at the at the premium live event. And as far as the match goes, Bronson Reed controlled pretty much the full beginning of this. And when Otis finally took over, Chad Gable started to yell at him because he starts doing his an- his antics. And Otis turned around into a kick from Bronson Reed and then ate a tsunami to lose that match. But ultimately, Chad Gable was the reason why he lost. I mean, was he though? He was gonna, he, I mean, he Otis distracted. was gonna do all his moves and, and it was Chad Gable who stopped him. Yeah, but he he distracted himself. He he started doing his dancing. No, and, I don't know. You know. And then afterwards, Chad Gable made Otis get back in the ring, and he called the rest of Alpha Academy out, and he said that Otis lacks discipline, and he's going to show him discipline. And this was a segment that was not easy to watch. And he's like, I don't want to do it, but I, if you're making me do this, and he takes off his belt. And he told him to grab the ropes, and Maxine stops Chad Gable from whipping Otis there. Yeah, like right when he was about to get whipped, Maxine just grabs his, grabs Gable's arm, prevents him from going forward with that motion, and Gable looks at her and throws her out. Says, get out of here, you, you don't belong in here, and kicks her to the curb. And then he goes up to Tazawa, starts to be little Tazawa, just for... Uh, Sami Zayn, theme song to hit. He starts coming down to the ring, consoles uh, consoles her at the entrance, and just keeps on going down to the ringside. Um, and it was interesting, their interactions with him and Gable, and Gable really just explaining how he's teaching the lesson and everything. Yeah, Sami Zayn told Chad Gable that he manipulated his way into multiple title matches and just came short, came up short every single time. Mm-hmm. And Sammy took that belt from Chad Gable and inched towards him. Otis stands in his way. 
And Sami Zayn questioned, and he brought him up, brought up, like, listen to the fans. Listen to the people. Stop listening to Chad Gable. Mm-hmm. And then Chad Gable attacked Sami Zayn, and Sami came back. Otis was super conflicted about doing anything. He ends up ripping Sami Zayn off, and Chad Gable gets the upper hand and, and hits him with that German suplex. And I thought this was one hell of a segment. I agree. I thought it was a great segment. The crowd the crowd was so heavily involved and in, into this segment too. Everybody was chanting and so support uh, supportive of Otis and everybody else. I mean, yeah. I thought that this was awesome. The one thing that I um never mind. We didn't hear Gable's theme song at all. So we didn't get to hear it, the you suck to hear if it carried over. I, were they not chanting you suck though? I don't remember. I think they were. I feel like they were. All right, good. After that, Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark were interviewed, and they spoke about the champions and invited them to Monday Night Raw. And then Sonya Deville showed up and said that they're not going to win the titles without her. And Shayna was like, I've beaten literally everyone. I'm former tag team champion. And then Isla Dawn and Alba Fire overheard that, and they were like, well, you haven't beaten everybody, so... I assume Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark will uh, eventually, maybe next week, beat Isla Dawn and Alba Fire. Yeah. So, and then the main event, we saw a steel cage match. Liv Morgan picked up the victory over Becky Lynch to retain the championship. A lot of people thought this would be Becky Lynch's final match in WWE, and she looked quite emotional making her entrance, and she looked quite emotional in this match. And it was around this time that the news was getting out there to the sheets and on the internet that it's it's her last match uh, with the WWE that her contract, contract yeah that her contract expires on June first. Um, definitely was not expecting all of that to happen. I can't see her going anywhere else. I can't. So I can't see her going anywhere else. But I could see her taking time away to be with her child. I mean, Seth Rollins is out injured right now, so it it makes sense that you could have literally have all three of you as a family just be together. Yeah, so why not take advantage of that time that you could all be together? She's just, I mean, she just got done with a successful book tour. Yeah, I mean, I would say, if anything, I think that I think that the WWE is being very risky with the contracts, but I also kind of dig it. (laughs) Very much so. But if that was her final match in WWE, then that's, I think, automatically Hall of Fame career. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it's not the last time we see Becky Lynch. I really don't think it will be. I can't see her going to AEW. I know people are like, oh, AEW will probably offer her a huge contract, the biggest contract for any woman. She'd be stupid not to take it, but... Would, would she really go to another company and be f- on separate schedules than Seth, basically? Mm-hmm. I don't see that happening, but hopefully uh, Becky Lynch does what Becky Lynch wants to do, what what's good for her. As far as this match goes, I thought this was a, a good match. Uh, some of the angles that they were using in this made this cage seem bigger than it was, which I thought was cool to see. Mm-hmm. I feel like we don't normally get angles like that, but... I like Becky Lynch doing the disarm her on the top rope. But Dominic Mysterio made his way out. He opened the door for Becky Lynch to just walk out and win. I, yeah, this, this end was awesome. I thought, I thought that this ending was well planned, well, well conducted, you know, it didn't fully make sense, but it was well done. So that's the thing. I feel like it did. So it did make sense. No, Finn it, Balor and JD McDonough ran down to argue with Dominic. Be like, exactly. why are you like? How does that make sense? Okay, so ready. So it, for me, it makes sense to not make fully to not make full sense because we don't want to give away the storyline fully right now. So with Dominic Mysterio going out there, we don't know what happened backstage. We still have the clip of both of them leaving the locker room together. Also, have, also. There's mm-hmm. a clip when, uh, I don't know if it was this week on Raw or last week on Raw, Finn Balor and Liv Morgan pulled up together. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Huh. I think we're getting a new Judgment Day where they're kicking Priest out to the curb. I didn't see that at all. That's interesting. But then with Balor and McDonough coming out to 
get I mean it makes sense to me because they're like Dom what are you doing out here get to the backstage you know maybe maybe they maybe Dom told them a little bit about stuff right you know and they're just trying to get him out of there and then accuse Braun to come on out because of everything that took place earlier in the night and then that leading to Braun knocking uh, Dominic into the steel cage the door smashing into Becky Lynch and then leading to Liv Morgan climbing out. I thought that that was it, it seemed it very Looney Tunish, but <laughs> it but it works for me. Yeah, I thought that was a great ending and then Monday Night Raw for us in the United States ends with Liv Morgan just staring Dominic down. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're on Twitter and everyone's like, "Oh my God, what? What? Oh my God, what, she, she kissed him." I'm like, "What? What do you mean? What do you mean she kissed him? Where did you see this?" <laughs> Everyone else that was watching Monday Night Raw saw Liv Morgan walk up to Dominic and just make out with him. Crazy, yeah, uh, shocker, especially that this didn't make USA Television. Apparently, it was on Hulu too. The Hulu TV showed it, but not USA Network. They cut right before it happened. Um, then I saw some places like Busted Open, Believe was saying how he finds it hard to believe that this wasn't scripted, that maybe it was a way to push people towards social media. Because then if you air it on TV... Yeah, but everyone else had it except for the United States. So how does that yeah, work? That's the thing. That's where it didn't really make too much sense to me. I don't know. It, it doesn't... It doesn't make sense that this such a big payoff didn't get shown on television. Either way, I think Monday Night Raw could have ended either way and it would have been completely fine. Yeah, I with the kiss or without the kiss, I thought that it was a great ending for Monday Night Raw and it makes me even more excited to see what's uh, what's on deck with everything. Moving to who NXT, we had Ava open the show and she brought Sexy Red out. Sexy Red announced that she'll be the host of Battleground. And they also unveiled the Women's North American Championship. I think it looks very nice. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Um, Tatum Paxley, though, crawled into the ring and tried to rip it away from Sexy Red. And then Mia Yim attacked her, setting up for their match. That was the qualifying match. Which was Mia Yim picking up the victory over Tatum Paxley to move on to that ladder match. We saw Jada Parker come out to watch this. And I liked what we got in this match. I just wish it was longer. Yeah. I I thought it was a solid matchup. And I think that the ladder matches that they have been putting on with NXT has been really entertaining. And I think that Mia Yim versus Tatum Paxley definitely lived up to expectations for a ladder match in there. I also wish we could have had Tatum Paxley and Mia Yim both move on to the ladder match because well, I forget what event it was the other the other month or so when Tatum Paxley was in that championship match. Oh, yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah, she, yeah I, I agree with you. I think that, I mean, if I had to choose, I'd rather Tatum be in there than Mia, but I get Mia with the veteran status and everything taking yeah, place. Yeah, I think but... it'll be good for her to be in there. And I, I mean, Mia Yim, let's not take anything away from Mia Yim. She is a fantastic worker. 100%. And it's been, I don't want to, I mean, it's it's been kind of years since we've seen the version of Mia Yim that should have always been on television. Yeah, and she's not out of her prime either. No. You know, just because she's been a veteran for so long, she is far from out of her prime. Yeah. So, first Next match, up. oh, second match, I should say. <laughs> Ridge Holland picked up the victory over Riley Osborne. Uh, Thea Hale seemed like she knew that Ridge had this match won, but also seemed like she wished that Ridge didn't have to do this. And after the match, Ridge Holland picked Riley up for a handshake, and Riley walked off. He's pissed off. And we yeah. saw Riley yell at Chase U later on, saying, same thing he's been saying, I do not trust Ridge. He cannot be trusted. And then Duke Hudson agreed with him. Yeah, I was not expecting this. I mean, are you ready for the breakup of them? Of Chase I don't want to break up there. <laughs> I mean, I, not at all, do I? I don't want that at all. Yeah, after that, surpri- surprisingly, Chase U has actually been very entertaining. Yeah. The entire time. Even the, the segments that 
Chris Jericho's skating kind of close to kind of close to Andre Chase right now, but those segments I think have been great for Chase, mm-hmm. not Jericho. Mm-hmm. Uh, after that, we saw the OC where they delivered a promo. They want the titles, and they said that the beatdowns are going to continue until they get their title shot. Fast forward, you got the OC picking up the victory over Idris Sanofi and Malik Blade. Continuing on the bad luck aspect, perhaps, Brindley Reese got knocked over by mistake from, uh, I think it was from Anofi. And Anofi had a quick comeback, but there was no way the OC was losing this match. And then we saw the champions, Axiom and Nathan Fraser, attack the OC afterwards. And then that match gets set up for Battleground. I think, hopefully, we'll see the OC walk out as champions. Nah. After that, we had Roxanne Perez come out, and she spoke about how everyone that's held the NXT Women's Championship always used used the championship to get somewhere else. And she's the only one that appreciates it and the only one that that is champion for the championship. She worked her whole life to get the NXT championship, basically. And then we find out who she's going to be facing at Battleground. Ava comes out. And it's the TNA Knockouts champion, Jordan Grace. I mean, <laughs> wow. <laughs> that threw me threw me off big time. Wow. There were a lot of expletives. There was a lot of clapping. <laughs> I I wasn't expecting that at all. Yeah. I mean, there were so many people that were that you could have selected. Nobody I don't think would ever say Jordan Grace. Ava um, last week or so said she spoke to Adam Pierce, she spoke to Nick Aldis about it and she thinks she has that decision. And then to find this out, I just it was like mind blowing because there was mm-hmm. there was no rumors. You didn't see any spoilers or anything. It was so refreshing to not have TNA Knockouts champion is in Orlando right now, going through Twitter that day. So yeah. I think it's going to be awesome to see Roxanne Perez versus Jordan Grace, and then we see Stevie Turner later on annoyed that Jordan Grace just gets to walk in and get a championship match. She's like, what has she done to earn this this title shot? Mm -hmm. I was left out of the combine for some reason. I've been working my way up on level up. Use me. Like, I want to prove myself or whatever. And then Jordan Grace walked in and she offered her a match for next week. So we're going to see the TNA Knockouts champion face Stevie Turner on NXT television and that i think alone is crazy it's crazy that the champion is wrestling on an nxt premium live event it would be even crazier if the knockout title was on the line next week i don't think it's going to be Mm -hmm. but i'm pumped to see stevie turner versus jordan grace as well it's been a long time since stevie turner's been on tv yeah this is just incredible After that, we saw Lola Vice pick up the victory over Ariana Grace. Obviously, Ariana Grace was not winning this match, but uh, I don't know. I guess they ditched the the, the whole storyline with Gigi Dolan. Yeah, I was reading that they they totally ditched it. I don't know what's... uh, Maybe they will bring it back up. I don't know what's going on with that, but there hasn't been mention of it in quite some time, but... Lola Vice got that victory, and then she she said to Shayna Baszler afterwards that you're you have two options at Battleground, at uh, NXT, what is it on NXT Underground? No, that doesn't sound right. Mm-hmm. What do they call it? <laughs> is it under Underground? Battleground? No, Battleground's the name of the pay per view. What's the thing Shane McMahon did? Underground. That's Underground. Yeah, so they have an Underground match at the pay per view, the premium live event. Shayna Baszler can either get knocked out or tap out. And she's like, it's your choice. And then Shayna Baszler ran down, but she got held back. And I thought that was a very good segment there. I agree. I I like the fact that Shayna Baszler ran it down. And I I really want to see this, the bat, uh, blood sport, Shayna Baszler. Shayna Baszler said, I come from that same background. So like I said, last week, it'd be dope to see them actually go out there and, 
be allowed that MMA style. I don't know if that's going to be a thing, though, but... Nah. After that, we saw Dante Chen pick up the victory over Lexus King, which stemmed from a backstage segment where Lexus King basically called Dante Chen's win the other week a fluke. And we go into this match. Lexus controls most of this match. And in the end, Dante Chen rolled Lexus King up very quickly to, to get that victory out of nowhere. So maybe it was a fluke. Can you have two flukes in a row? I mean, you can. No? It seems like it. And then Lexus King attacked Dante Chen afterwards, and he ripped up the mats ringside. He had a neck a neck breaker, half on the floor, half on the, the pads. Mm-hmm. I think we'll see this one final time at Battleground with Dante Chen getting a definitive win. I hope. Yeah. They aired a video for Josh Briggs, which... They then cut to Sean Spears, who was watching that video of Josh Briggs, and he spoke about another lost soul in NXT who he can help. So where that leads, match, mentorship, I don't know. We're going to have to find out. Meanwhile, Brooks Jensen is uh, maybe released, nobody knows. For a few weeks now, he's just been posting tweets and pictures of him drinking alcohol and showing up to or kind of showing up to NXT Raw and SmackDown and being like they won't let me in seems like a gimmick but nobody's for certain yeah I would say definitely gimmicked hopefully I mean I think he's good in the ring after that, we saw Kalani Jordan pick up the victory over Ren Sinclair to move on to that ladder match, get that final spot for that NXT Women's North American Championship. Fallon Henley was on commentary for this, but I feel like she didn't really do anything on commentary. Yeah, uh, I agree. I, I did like the... Um, was it her with the handshake spot? I don't know. On commentary... I forgot, but I thought that it was entertaining still. Uh, and I think that I thought that this match, Kalani Jordan, I think she's going to be incredible. I mean, first of all, I think I fully expected it to be Kalani Jordan here. Mm-hmm. But I'm happy that Ren was able to get offense in at least. But knowing that we're about to have a ladder match with Sol Ruka, who we know is like really athletic with all the the flips and stuff that she's that she's able to do Mm -hmm. and then to also have kalani jordan who is inspired by rob van dam i am very much so pumped to see what she's going to do with the the ladder and all that stuff yeah i think that there's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of action we saw the main event take place. Trick Williams and Javon Evans picked up the victory over Gallus. Earlier in the night, Oro Mensa was attacked. So naturally, Jakara thought it was Trick and Javon. But Lash Legend still, um, she's denying the whole thing. It's not him. She knows for a fact it's not him. I thought they had a good tag team match. We saw Joe Coffey try to cheat. And then Sexy Red got involved and she took the title away from him. And then Javon Evans jumped... Uh, it jumped over, I think it was Mark Coffey to dive on to Joe, which was like a pretty crazy spot. Yeah. But then Trick Williams hits that knee and picks up that victory. And then afterwards, Lash Legend came out and she asked Trick about the attacks. And before he can answer, the lights go out. And when they came back on, you hear the, the crowd cheering or like, like trying surprised. to figure out what's taking place. Yeah. And Trick gets attacked from behind. Lash Legend got knocked down. Yeah, Trick. I don't know why Trick took her out like that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, and, and everybody this, saw it. This guy is just pounding on Trick Williams, and we're like, who is it? Who is that? He gets up, and it's like, I literally, I mean, there was expletive, expletive, a lot of claps, a <laughs> lot of market out here. Ethan freaking Page, all ego, shows up. And and takes the microphone. He attacked Oro Mensa. He took out Noam Dar. And then he's like, oh, whoop that trick. I think I'm about to. And he takes out Trick Williams. Yeah, hits him with that knee right into the corner. 
I mean, I was not expecting all ego and for him to show up. At first when he showed up, I, I had no clue that it was him too. Um, like I was trying to figure out, I'm like, who is that? But then when he got up, then I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't tell who was who, – I. The only person who ran through my head when Trick was being attacked, but it made no sense, was J.D. McDonough. And I know their hairs are different. They look different. The different facial hair and everything. Mm -hmm. But that's who I thought it was at first. I'm like, there's no way that's J.D. Who the hell is this? Yeah. And then Ethan Page, man, that was... I mean, we we learned uh, a few months ago, I think, that his contract with AEW was up, but there was literally no rumblings whatsoever about Ethan Page either, just like Jordan Grace. Mm -hmm. We don't know if Ethan Page is signed. There's conflicting reports. Uh, I think one of the news sites reported that he's been signed, and then Ethan Page himself said, I'm not signed. So, I, I, I was say blown that away. That he's signed. <laughs> uh, it does seem like that. But this was a great episode of NXT. I think... Even though it's not my cup of tea, I think Sexy Red was was really good at what she did. I got to agree with you, not my cup of tea. It was <laughs> <laughs> I was eating after NXT was over. I was starving. I was eating a bagel and mm -hmm. a video pops up on the timeline of Sexy Red in a car and it pans over. She's singing Sexy Boy. And it pans over to Shawn Michaels, who starts singing Sexy Boy too, and I almost choked on my bagel. Oh, no. I thought that was so funny. And then I saw an interview. I forget what the, what the person's name was. He did an interview with Shawn Michaels and asked if he's familiar with Sexy Red's uh, like famous catchphrase or whatever. And Shawn goes, oh, you mean ski ye? And I'm like, you don't expect to hear stuff like that. I think that's hilarious, too. So... She seemed to be very welcomed in that NXT family, and and Sean seemed to be very happy with her. And we'll see what she does at Battleground. Maybe she will get involved somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, all in all, like I said, this was a, a great episode of NXT. Moving over to SmackDown, it opened up with Nia Jax's coronation ceremony. And uh, there was a lot of heat from the crowd for Nia Jax, and she called Bailey out. Bailey made her way out to the ring, but got attacked by Piper Niven. And then Chelsea told Nia Jax that it's not Bailey that she has to worry about; it's Piper Niven. And Nia Jax basically said she doesn't care who's gonna be champion, I guess. Um, and then we saw Naomi go meet Bailey in the, the trainer's room and asked if she's uh, good to fight and the match gets set up. I thought in that segment, the, the, the Blair Davenport portion was good as well. Uh, but later in the night, in the main event, we saw Chelsea Green and Piper Niven pick up the victory over Bailey and Naomi. And Piper and Chelsea controlled a lot of this match. Bailey ended up getting the hot tag and uh, Naomi took over, but Piper ends up pushing Naomi off the top rope and took over again. And then Piper took out Bailey. She hit a scent on onto uh, Naomi and laid Chelsea Green onto, uh, onto Naomi to get that victory. First actual match of SmackDown saw Tommaso Ciampa pick up the victory over Austin Theory which stem from DIY asking Nick Aldis who the number one contenders are. And then a town down under walked in and made fun of them. I thought this was a good match. Grayson Waller got involved. Austin theory worked on Champa's neck in this. And in the end, Grayson Waller ended up yelling and claimed that he's the reason why Austin theory is successful again, alluding to, I guess not having success in, <laughs> since him or whatever. And that distracted Austin Theory, and Champa rolled Austin Theory up to pick up that victory. So next week, we're going to be seeing the opposite matchup between the two. We're going to see Grayson Waller versus Johnny Gargano. Tons of history there. We saw LA Knight and Nick Aldis, where LA Knight questioned Nick Aldis about AJ Styles, but he also questioned where Logan Paul was because he wants the U.S. championship, and Logan Paul's not there. He is there. And then Carmelo Hayes showed up and I think laid out a challenge, but like 
at the same time didn't lay out a challenge. So I don't know if we'll see that or what. We saw Andrade pick up the victory over Apollo Crews. Earlier in the night, Angel Garza tried to get Andrade a spot in Legato. And Andrade's like, thanks, but no thanks. And then uh, this match takes place. Apollo's last TV win was NXT in January 2023. So that's pretty crazy that that happened. But it's nice to see Apollo Crews on television. Angel Garza showed up to, not to, he distracted Andrade a little bit. By mistake, but he was also cheering Andrade on. So it wasn't malicious or anything. And then Andrade obviously gets that victory. And Santos Escobar, the rest of Legato came out. Santos cheered on the the victory. And Andrade walked right past Legato afterwards. And Angel Garza questioned Andrade about it. And said that he embarrassed him in front of Legato and the group. And then Apollo Crews attacked Angel Garza in the locker room. And that was separated. That gets set up for a match next week. After that, we had Paul Heyman and Solo Sokoa. And Paul Heyman told Solo that he's been doing a lot of thinking about how he can better serve Solo while he's in charge. And he said he sees a lot of random acts of violence, but there's no strategy to it. And they need to have... Cody Rhodes in check when Roman Reigns comes back and Solo said that they do have Roman uh, they do have Cody in check he doesn't know it and then Kevin Owens music hit and Solo told Paul Paul Heyman to, to go fix that deal with it and when Kevin Owens was out in the ring he spoke about how he went to Saudi Arabia because he wanted to make sure the bloodline couldn't do anything to Randy Orton to prevent Randy Orton from winning the King of the Ring tournament. He couldn't have Solo ruin that that chance. And then Paul Heyman interrupted and spoke about the new bloodline and how they they turned down having these new members because he and Roman Reigns didn't want them to represent the bloodline. And he said if he keeps calling Solo out, they're going to do something very bad. And then basically beg Kevin Owens to back off from Solo Sokoa. And Kevin Owens wasn't buying it. He got super fired up and and said he'll do everything he can to get rid of this new bloodline. He's been fighting with the bloodline for four years. He's gotten knocked down over and over again. And he's here. He's standing today. So he will continue to fight the bloodline. And then Paul Heyman got fired up, accidentally hit Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens got in Paul's face and the bloodline show up. Street Profits show up to have Kevin's back. It leads to a brawl. And then we get the match that was supposed to take place. It sets up Gorillas of Destiny. First match in WWE taking on the Street Profits. Corey Graves, I think, did a really good job here at putting them over. He mentioned... Them being a seven-time record-breaking IWGP tag team in New Japan. And just ultimately, I think it was really cool to see them team up in WWE. I liked at the, uh, towards the end of the match, that hot tag spot with Montez Ford. He shows up in that ring after that hot tag, super fired up. But eventually we see Tonga Loa get a blind tag on Tama Tonga. He took uh, a frog splash from Montez Ford after Dawkins tagged out and Tama Tonga got in the ring. Boom. Hits uh, hits Montez Ford with that finish to take him out. I thought that was a, a good segment. Good match. After that backstage, we saw Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair walking. They were talking about uh, Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark and Indy Harwell interrupted. And she was annoyed because they injured Candice LeRae's knee. And Bianca Belair was like, well, she did it to me first. And then Jade Cargill put Indy Hartwell on notice. It sets up a match for next week. We saw Mia Yim interviewed about AJ Styles. And Nia Jax interrupted that. And she said, don't step to her. To which Mia Yim stepped to her. 
I don't know when that'll take place. She's obviously got a match at Battleground next week, so I don't know when that'll take place, but it seems like we're going to see Nia Jax versus Mia Yim. And then to close the show, AJ Styles, earlier in the night, he, he went to Nick Aldis and he asked for time to speak. And Nick Aldis is like, do you have anything to tell me? And AJ's like, it's hard enough to say it once, so I'd rather just go out there and say it one time. And we saw AJ Styles met up with LA Knight before going to the ring. He met up with Cody Rhodes. He met up with the met up with the OC, and the OC went with him to the ring. That's the first time we've seen them together in weeks. And AJ Styles said he can't go at this time in his life, in this time in his career. He can't go to the back of the line for the WWE Championship like Nick Aldis said. And he spoke about how being at home over this past week, he got to see his son graduate high school. And it hit him that how many times has he missed a moment like this? And maybe he should just stay home instead of being the phenomenal AJ Styles, just be a phenomenal dad. And then he and the OC, too sweeted, they hugged. And AJ Styles called Cody Rhodes to the ring and said he had one of the greatest matches of his career with Cody Rhodes at Backlash. And if that's the match that he has to go out on, then that's the match he's fine with going out on. And he said that it's still the house that AJ Styles built. And the reason why he called Cody to the ring was to hand him the keys. And then they hugged and AJ Styles uh, or Cody Rhodes held up AJ's arm all over the arena so they could take pictures and cheer. And then pretty similar to what we all thought was going to happen, like Mark Henry and John Cena, Cody Rhodes got the hell beat out of him by AJ Styles. And he even hit a uh, Styles clash off the steel steps to end SmackDown. I thought that was a great ending. Even though we all saw that that ending happening, I thought that was that was very well done, and uh, I guess we'll see Cody Rhodes versus AJ Styles happening soon. But that's SmackDown. Going to take a quick little break, and I'll be right back here on Marking Out. This is Amazing Kong, and you're listening to Marking Out. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Marking Out, episode 695. Moving back to AEW Rampage from last week, we saw Pac pick up the victory over Rocky Romero. I thought the match was fine, but Rocky Romero never wins any matches. They can tout how great he is and how he's held titles all over the world, but he's done nothing in AEW but lose. His last victory that people actually saw was full gear in 2022. So, and I'll talk more about that later on because it's just annoying. Death Triangle joined Pac afterwards and Pac put Bullet Club uh, Bullet Club Gold on notice for Collision. On Collision, we saw the Lucha Bros pick up the victory over the guns. And not that I was going to tune into the pay-per-view. I didn't plan on it, but I wish that this wasn't taking place the night before they were going to be facing off on pay-per-view. But with that said, they're both talented teams, and I enjoyed this match. After that, Samoa Joe picked up the victory over Dom Kubrick. I think that's how it said. There was a segment with Chris Jericho, Shibata, and Hook before this. And Samoa Joe yelled at Hook after the altercation. And I, I'll speak more about it with, with Dynamite, but it, it very much so seems like a budding mentorship. The Joe match was meaningless. We know who Joe is. We don't need to see Samoa Joe and what he's capable of like that. But I will talk more about that when we get to AEW Dynamite. After that, Roosh picked up the victory over Isaiah Cassidy. Cassidy's overall record for 2024 isn't great at all. But I'm glad that we got an opponent like Isaiah Cassidy for Roosh. Someone who's an established professional wrestler on that AEW roster 
to face Roosh and make Roosh look how Roosh should always have looked. He had the match one in like 20 seconds, maybe. And he kept going. I don't understand that part. And I also hated the fact that the referee was allowing Roosh to use the cable to choke Isaiah. But I wouldn't be opposed to seeing Roosh win his matches somewhat quickly via ref stoppage. And then he can go out and do all the stuff he wants with the cables. I think there's zero reason why Isaiah Cassidy should have had a comeback in this. I think there's zero reason why Isaiah Cassidy had Roosh in a match for almost 10 minutes. Especially when it was over in 20 seconds. So I would have changed that, but I'm happy that Roosh got that match. After that, Chris Statlander and Willow Nightingale picked up the victory over Alex Windsor and Anna Jay. I don't really understand putting Alex Windsor on television like that without having any build to it because you could hear commentary put her over, put the titles and and her success from other companies over, but it would have been nice to have a bigger introduction to to Alex Windsor. Perhaps it was done to have Willow be an international talent before going up to face uh, Mercedes Monet. I don't know. I just would have liked to have seen Willow run through an opponent the night before or the the two nights before she was facing Mercedes Monet. And Alex Windsor wouldn't have been that proper opponent to do that. So, uh, but Mercedes showed up afterwards and they brawled and Mercedes was barely able to lift Chris Statlander for her finisher. So that was goofy. And then their fight looked more like a cat fight, which I really don't prefer to watch in present day wrestling. And then on collision, Willow cut a very nice promo about Mercedes Monet. But I think that fight that took place on rampage should have just been done with Willow coming out on top. You could have just done that on, on collision instead. So I would have changed that. And then moving over to AEW Collision, we saw John Moxley and Don Callis. Boring promo from Don Callis, where he said he and John Moxley are so much alike in that they're psychopaths who see everything but feel nothing. It was also Don Callis trying to get John Moxley to call off the match against Takeshita at Double or Nothing. And then Takeshita showed up to beat John Moxley down. Brian and Claudio eventually ran down to chase Takeshita off, but maybe just to remind everybody they're still a group because we've not seen them as a group recently, which has been quite goofy. After that, Claudio, Daniel Garcia, and Tanahashi picked up the victory over Lance Archer and the Righteous. I truly, truly believe, I hate saying it, but I believe that Tanahashi... A, either needs to retire or B, change his moveset because what he's working with currently does not work for him. He moves way too slow and and it, his moveset doesn't truly fit him at, at that current speed. This match was chaotic at times, but I enjoyed seeing Lance Archer and the Righteous in this match. I'd obviously like to see them win matches but I still enjoyed it afterwards Kyle O'Reilly picked up the victory over Kevin Matthews again good use of Kevin Matthews here I don't know what they're building Kyle O'Reilly up to for him to face next uh, outside of what was announced for collision but uh, it was an enjoyable quick whatever many minute match it was Then we saw the House of Black, Buddy Matthews and Brody King pick up the victory over the acclaimed, the infantry and the Gates of Agony, which this seemed like it only took place so that they could air the promo from Edge afterwards about how his wedding ring was the only thing keeping him tied to his normal world. I guess alluding to a a much darker Edge, a brood Edge which I'll get to. 
Then we saw Mariah May pick up the victory over Layla Hirsch. Uh, Layla returned in April, and we haven't seen her since. So that sucks. But I think the biggest misstep from this match was that it was shorter than the match that Mariah May had against Harley Cameron. Because Layla Hirsch, I think, is an actual formidable opponent. And I don't think Harley Cameron is. Harley Cameron had one match in AEW, I believe. So, or two matches. So I think that should have been shorter. This should have been longer. And then in the main event, you saw Brian Danielson and FTR pick up the victory over Triple J. <laughs> Triple J, how they got themselves in that main event of Dynamite last week. And then Collision last week is well beyond me. Even more so how Satnam Singh got himself into two main event matches like that. Especially after that mess on Dynamite. I could have done without this match. I'm shocked that none of the shows ended with a giant brawl though. AEW loves doing that. Especially leading up to Double or Nothing. I'm very happy it didn't end. None of the shows ended with a brawl. FTR then afterwards cut a promo. A pro AEW promo. Just to hype up why they're fighting for AEW against the Elite. I don't really think it sold the pay-per-view. But uh, that was Collision. Moving over to Double or Nothing taking place at the MGM Grand Gardens Arena. Is that what it's called in in Vegas? On the buy-in, you had Deanna Perrazzo pick up the victory over Thunder Rosa. Um, I thought this was pretty good. Deanna Perrazzo ends up grabbing the ropes when the referee couldn't see, so she got the leverage to pick up the victory over Thunder Rosa. Thunder Rosa, by the way, had a really cool gear that night. The actual... Oh, no, they actually had uh, another kickoff match. They had the acclaimed and Billy Gunn picking up the victory over the Cage of Agony. Mess of a match. Very, very messy. You had the Vegas Knights mascot out there helping the acclaimed by taking a chair away from Brian Cage. So that was the biggest spot of the match. Uh, But then moving on to the actual pay-per-view itself, Will Ospreay picked up the victory over Roderick Strong to become the new international champion. The officiating in this match was awful. Absolutely awful. The kingdom got involved a bunch of times. Wardlow shows up. All of it was bad. With the outside interference. Take all of that out. Take out the the horrible officiating. And I enjoyed this match. This was one of two matches that I thought were the, the two best matches on the card. Don Callis tried to get Will Ospreay to use that Tiger Driver 91. Again, he would not use it. Kind of surprised that Will Ospreay won. After not using it, especially since that Owen Hart Cup stipulation now gets you the title shot at all in. But I'm glad that he didn't lose this match. But now do we see, I mean, not to spoil anything. It's not really a spoiler if you're listening to this, I'm sure. He's now number one contender to the AEW championship. Surely he's not going to be doing anything at all in in regards to the AEW Championship, now that they're doing it at Forbidden Door. So, I don't think he'll be winning that Owen Hart Cup. So, who wins that? I have no idea. After that, Adam Cole came out, which was so goofy. His his group literally just lost. He wasn't there for it, but he comes out for this. He didn't care about Roderick Strong losing. And then all of a sudden... He comes out for this. How does that make any sense? That was so stupid. And then MJF returned in a 2002 Triple H jacket. Cut a kind of cringe promo. And then said he's done with the devil. And he's in AEW to stay. He showed off a tattoo on his leg. He called himself the wolf of of wrestling. Was something like that. Take on Wolf of Wall Street, which is basically the the goddamn devil. Same exact tactics. So, the only thing he's changing is that he's he's not really a good guy. 
the kangaroo kick that was super over goes away. Put a pin in that until next week because we have almost no follow-up with that. Bullet Club Gold picked up the victory over Death Triangle to retain the trio's championships. Juice Robinson returned and prevented Death Triangle from winning. So that's all you got to know about that. Tony Storm picked up the victory over Serena Deeb to retain the championship. I thought this was a decent match. They made it look like Serena Deeb could win, but I really didn't think that she was going to be walking out as champion. So... Uh, after that, Orange Cassidy picked up the victory over Trent. Orange Cassidy's theme song played, and then he didn't come out. And then his old theme song played, and he came out. I think it would have been a bigger pop had his old theme song also played, and Sue drove him to the ring. Kind of like a slap in the face to Trent to be like, how dare my son, like, my son, you're acting so bad or whatever. Something like that. I think it makes sense. I don't know. Uh, but he came out in darker denim, a black t-shirt, Ray-Bans instead of aviators. And of course, Trent lost. <laughs> I thought it was a decent match, but it's just too predictable with with Orange Cassidy. And then Rocky Romero showed up afterwards and Renee tried to interview Trent, but Trent walked off. After that, Chris Jericho picked up the victory over Hook and Shibata to retain. We saw Big Bill get involved. He went through a table and got super lucky there. Somehow the legs, I still don't understand. The legs were like up through the table, the top of the table. I don't understand how that happened. But then a man in all black with a lucha mask showed up to help Chris Jericho. And they... Unmasked to reveal that it was Brian Keith. So, at least he fits into that storyline now. Now it makes sense as to why he had a title shot or a chance at the title shot in the first place. After that, John Moxley picked up the victory over Takeshita. Takeshita spent a majority of this match working John Moxley's bad arm. So I wish Takeshita was able to win this. But in the end, Takeshita threw a chair into the ring and then slid another one in. And when the referee was dealing with that other chair for like nine hours, Takeshita, he gets into the ring, gets hit with a curb stomp onto that chair. The referee had to have seen that. And I thought that was just such a bad ending, but Mox, kind of no surprise, picks up the victory. After that, Edge picked up the victory over Malachi Black in a barbed wire steel cage match to retain the TNT Championship. Edge came out with the brood on his Titan Tron. It was a, I think it was a Slayer song. Uh, apparently he owns the brood name. I don't know how that's a thing, but apparently he is ownership or owner of that. Um... But you're not the brood without the brood theme. No offense. That, I think, is a uh, a big help. Or not a big help. A big part of the brood was that theme song. But uh, this match was a bloody mess of a match. And in a good way. Edge, though, at one point, man, he climbed to the top of the cage and then jumped straight down to... I, I still don't know how the table broke. He, like... He drops straight down and uh, I guess elbow drops Malachi Black onto a uh, barbed wire table. I don't know if, may I guess they miscalculated the, the distance that the table needed to be. But that was a crazy, crazy spot. And they eventually made their way out of the cage. House of Black showed up and joined Edge. And everyone was like shocked and... Almost HL, uh, HLS, hook, line, sinker. I couldn't think of that for a second. But uh, they quickly jumped edge. And the crowd ate that up. And they had edge up in the ring 
Malachi Black reacts before anything happens, and then the lights go out with they they go red. Gangrel showed up to help Edge, and uh, he ends up getting got. But Edge took over, wrapped Malachi Black in barbed wire uh, for the crossface to pick up the victory. And I thought that was a cool match. Um, Gangrel being there was like chef's kiss. I don't mean to make weird. Uh, I hate. I would if I would if I was listening to a podcast. I would have hated that. I just did that, but deal with it. <laughs> After that, Mercedes Monet picked up the victory over Willow Nightingale to become the new TBS champion. Fans were going crazy for this match. I liked Willow hitting that doctor bomb on the apron. She went for another one from the middle rope, but Mercedes reversed that. Started to work on Willow's ankle. That was the same injury that that Mercedes was out with. And then Willow again tried for a doctor bomb later on. Mercedes reversed it, but Willow was able to take over from there. She eventually started working Mercedes' ankle. And Mercedes went after Chris Statlander, so her and Stokely argue with the referee. Willow hit the doctor bomb, and the referee was busy with that. She went for another one, and Mercedes locked in an STF. And then she eventually hits her new finisher to pick up the finish. Uh, I don't like Mercedes' Mercedes, uh, finisher because she can't hit it on people. I don't like that at all. But I do wish that they repeated the spot from the New Japan show where Mercedes got her ankle injured. But maybe they didn't want to risk that. I I feel like that would have fit into the story. But Stokely ends up yelling at them afterwards and Chris Statlander pushed him down. And then she was walking with Willow Nightingale to the back and dropped Willow. So that partnership is done. After that, we saw Swerve pick up the victory over Christian to retain the championship. Uh, This was boring to me. The Patriarchy got involved. Prince Nana tried to prevent Shayna Wayne with the championship. And then the referee saw him, kicked him from ringside. Which is so stupid because he's the, the manager of the champion. The manager should be able to hold his champion's championship during a match. That's wrestling 101. And then the patriarchy beat Swerve down. Kill Switch accidentally hit Christian and Swerve took over the match, but the referee eventually ejects the patriarchy. But Nick Wayne runs back out, takes Swerve out. Prince Nana chases him to the back, and then they continued a bit more, and Swerve got the victory. I wasn't for it. This match does nothing for me. It does nothing in my eyes for the AEW championship. Not a good look for me. Main event saw the elite pick up the victory over team AEW and anarchy in the arena. Team AEW started the match during the elites entrance. They did a bit later in the match where uh, the bucks stopped Darby Allen's theme song for them to have their own theme song playing. And then Brian Danielson interrupted that. To have the final countdown play for the match. I, I That was like a, a breath of much needed life into this, into this match for me. It was already after midnight. And then the Bucks eventually made them cut it off. They were like, we already wasted such and such money. So I thought that was funny. They did a spot. Although they walked it back on Dynamite where Darby got hit by a bus. We weren't quite sure if he did or did not get hit. But we didn't see Darby Allen there. And he did eventually make his way back out. Jack Perry attacked Tony Khan, a la the CM Punk footage. Goofy. And then Darby Allen, he, oh, by the way, <laughs> Jack Perry takes Tony Khan, throws him down, and Tony Khan does the goofiest ro- roll down that entrance ramp. And then just gets up and runs to the back as if nothing happened to him. <laughs> I'm sure if you're listening to this, you saw the, the whole clip that of Tony doing that. It's quite possibly one of the funniest things I've ever seen from AEW. 
But uh, Darby Allen then lit Jack Perry on fire. And the Bucks put him out. I knew that Jungle Boy, when they were backstage with that with uh, Tony Khan, I was like, why does he look all wet? So obviously that's why he was covered in probably that, that fire gel. And it was a very safe fire spot. So maybe people on the independent scenes when they work with fire like that should take lessons by, by AEW standards here. But uh, the Elite ended up hanging Darby Allen up by his feet. They super kicked him with thumbtacks in their new sneakers, which you can get at Champs or whatever it's called. And then they tried to do that to Daniel Bryan, Brian Danielson, but he moved. And Matt hit Nick. And then Brian took Matt's shoe. But Jungle Jack eventually hit the flying knee on Brian to pick up the victory for Team The Elite. Moving over to AEW Dynamite, we saw Mercedes have a championship celebration where she put Willow Nightingale over and she said that she always knew that Stokely and Chris Statlander were going to screw her. And then she said when Willow comes back, she's hoping she kicks their asses. And I'm like, where the hell's Willow? Is she out injured? All she did was lose a title. What do you mean when she comes back? I didn't get that. I hope Willow's fine. But Mercedes brought up Forbidden Door And then Sky Blue showed up on the screen and revealed that it was her that attacked her a few weeks ago. And then she showed up from behind and attacked her. And then they made that a match for later on. And later on, we saw Mercedes Monet pick up the victory over Sky Blue to retain the championship. I definitely didn't expect to have the match take place on Dynamite on the same show. But I was pumped to see it. I thought it was going to be the main event. So it was surprising when it wasn't. But I enjoy this match. I do think Sky Blue had too much offense. And I think now that Mercedes is there and using that finisher of hers, she, Sky Blue needs to ditch that Skyfall. Especially when you're in a match with Mercedes. When it's basically the same move, just in reverse. So, outside of that, I enjoyed the match. Stephanie Vacor showed up afterwards, and they both held up their titles. They had a video package for her earlier, where she's the current CMLL Women's Champion. She's also the New Japan Strong Women's Champion. And commentary mentioned Forbidden Door, so, I mean, it's... They both held up their titles. I'm pretty sure that that'll be the match. I'm sure that's the match that they've wanted to have for a, wh- a while now. So, should be an awesome match. After that, Swerve picked up the victory over Kill Switch, which only happened because of HBO's House of the Dragon. And I'm not going to talk about this match because the champion and the championship deserves better. This was not a good follow-up from a five-year anniversary pay-per-view. The only thing that I need to mention here is how goofy it looked when Swerve cut the extension. It wasn't, you can clearly see it wasn't even attached to Luchasaurus, uh, Killswitch's head. After that, we had TV time with the learning tree which was a low-budget highlight reel hosted by Chris Jericho. He brought out Brian Keith and said, and Brian Keith was like, people don't show Jericho the respect he deserves. And then Hook showed up, he took security out, and Samoa Joe showed up somehow in front of Hook. And they go face-to-face, and Samoa Joe whispers something in Hook's ear, and they left. I don't care about the learning tree gimmick, but I'm excited for the pairing of Samoa Joe and Hook. I said this a few weeks ago. I might've said this last week. I said it earlier, that mentorship, that that's going to be happening. It has to. So I'm excited for that. And at least Brian Keith and Big Cass are being used. After that, John Moxley picked up 
the victory over Rocky Romero in an eliminator match for the IWGP Championship. In a match that should not have happened. I don't care if this was a dream match for Rocky in his hometown. I said this before, he has no victories. His last singles victory in AEW was on AEW Dark Elevation in 2021. And his last victory in AEW was a dark match in May of last year. He did nothing to earn this. And even with a bad shoulder, this makes John Moxley look bad. This makes the IWGP Championship look bad. This was dumb to do. After that, we had Don Callis come out. He offered Orange Cassidy a contract to join the family. Orange Cassidy ripped the contract up. And then Stokely showed up with Chris Statlander. And Chris Statlander said on behalf of her best friend, or something like that, her best friend accepts the invitation. And then Trent blindsided Orange Cassidy. I think you had to have all of them tie in somehow together. Because prior to this, her heel turn didn't make sense because she was with Orange Cassidy, she was trying to separate all that. And Chuck Taylor. So none of that made sense. So I'm happy that we got this. Trent and Don Callis ended up doing that best friend's hug. Don, I thought was hilarious in that part. Later on, Stokely cut a promo about Willow. And then Chris Statlander spoke and said that she's finally doing something for herself. But she's getting booed for it. And she's done being the protector. So I'm happy that we're getting this evolution of Chris Statlander. Again, I don't know where the hell Willow is. I'm really hoping she's not injured. After that, it took almost an hour and a half to make mention of MJF's return and Adam Cole. And MJF wasn't even there. And Adam Cole is apparently not even cleared to wrestle. So all that that took place on the pay-per-view I thought was so dumb. And then they aired a a hype video for MJF and said he'll be there live next week and the fans booed. (laughs) And then Roosh cut like a 10-second promo on MJF. I don't know what that is going to do, but we'll see what happens next week on Dynamite. After that, we have the Elite come out and address the TNT Championship with Edge uh, unfortunately out. That that spot where he f- fell straight down off the cage, took him out, broke his ankle, his leg, his tibia, I mean. So that's very unfortunate. And I thought the only outcome of that was that they needed to award Jungle Boy the championship. Even though I hate everything about this storyline... But storyline-wise, I think that was what was needed. And the Young Bucks tried to award the championship to Jack Perry. But then Christopher Daniels showed up and said he got a new job. He's no longer fired. He's the interim executive vice president. I guess maybe filling in for Kenny. And then he announced that they're not going to be giving Jungle Boy the title. They're not giving the championship away. And he announced a tournament that'll lead to a ladder match. Pretty much what, it sounds like what NXT just did with the Women's North American Championship. And then the Elite went to attack Christopher Daniels, but the Acclaimed randomly backed him up. How that makes any sense, I have no clue. But a tournament is not it. They should have just had Jungle Boy have that title that that's to me the only option there the main event saw will osprey win the casino gauntlet battle royal to earn a title shot for the AEW championship at forbidden door i thought the sudden death rule was was i didn't know what it was until the actual pinfall took place the first pinfall i thought it was stupid Because someone could have won the match before everyone else was in the match. So I thought that was goofy. I also think it's goofy that Will Ospreay was in this. He just won the international championship on pay-per-view. And I think if you're going to be a champion challenging another champion, 
You should be an established champion and be champion for longer than three days. Build up the title. Build up the fact that you have the championship. You're you're nothing as champion right now and you're just going to go for another title right away. That does not make any sense to me. Build up the title that you have now first. Like, I I hate that it's Will Ospreay now going to face the AEW champion. I'm sure the match will be fantastic. But the story out of that is dumb. The buildup for that is dumb. What's he going to do with the international championship? Is he going to wrestle twice that night? But Jay White and Pac opened this match. The second Mystico came out after that. Shota Umino was in this. Claudio. Leo Rush showed up. That was surprising. He hasn't been there, uh, I think, since like 2021. Shota has been, I think he was there probably, what, 2022 maybe? Not 100% sure. I thought it was annoying that Orange Cassidy was in this. He was left a bloody mess earlier. Not able to move with Trent. But now he's able to look like he can win this, this match. That makes Trent look terrible, I think. And then the last person in this match was Hechicero. I, I don't need to continue talking about how much I didn't like the fact that Will won this. Uh, Soraya versus Mariah May was supposed to take place, but they ended up moving the match to another show. I guess they can't do more than two, uh, more than one woman's match per, per night. And outside of that... And a few other things on this show. I thought this was actually a pretty decent episode of Dynamite. For the first time in a very long time, I thought this was a very decent episode. It was just a horrible follow-up for a five-year anniversary pay-per-view. So it's like one side, good episode by itself. The other side, did it do everything it should have following a pay-per-view? Not in my eyes. But... That's AEW Dynamite. Hey, Brandon. Got any shout outs? I'm Louie Anderson, and survey says Brandon shout outs. The first shout out goes to the Beach Boys documentary on Disney Plus. I enjoyed it, but I felt like it was missing a lot. What was missing? I don't know. Like, I fully expected an interview at least with John Stamos. He wasn't even in it. And for it it being almost two hours long, I thought we would have gotten something like that. I could have watched this for two more hours. I wish this was like in three parts where they were each two hours because I could have watched it for like six hours. It's the Beach Mm -hmm. Boys. And I think if you're a fan of the Beach Boys, you probably know mostly everything in this. But I still recommend watching it, especially since Memorial Day was like the unofficial beginning of summer. So to me, you can't have summer without the beach boys i agree i agree and still one of my biggest regrets was not going to see them on a july 4th i forget what year it was it was in coney island so i didn't really want to go to coney island but i'm just glad that i was able to see them yeah when when did you see them which lineup i saw i don't know (laughs) oh we went i think we went yeah Yeah, we we saw it was uh it was mike love and bruce johnson that version of the beach boys Mm -hmm. i've seen every from, yeah, you saw uh, Stamos. Yeah, from 2007 to whenever the last time I saw them, I've seen like every iteration of the Beach Boys. That's awesome. I mean, they they're they're classic. I mean, I we heard the commercial for this and right away I'm like, yeah, it's it's almost summertime. Yeah. Like automatically and then I just wanted to listen to them. I it's... met I met Brian Wilson twice. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Once I went on my own to New York City to get a, a CD signed, they weren't allowing people to take pictures. So that sucked. And then I think it might have been like the year after that, somebody from my high school married his like best friend. Oh, wow. And she saw me at, uh, it was a like a, t- a TA, not not like a student or anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She saw me at the at the, at a Brian Wilson concert. And she goes, "Oh my God, do you want to meet Brian Wilson?" I'm like, "Uh, yeah." 
So I, I went, it was me, my mom, and my mom's friend. I didn't even get anything signed then. I probably should have because, like, how stupid are you? Like, take advantage of that? Yeah. Not that I had anything to really get signed, but I uh, all I wanted was a picture with Brian Wilson because, I mean, the Beach Boys, to me, top-tier band, so. 100%. And Brian Wilson, the way his brain worked and everything, so. I agree. Check it out, Beach Boys documentary, Disney+. Plus. My next shout-out goes to South Park, The End of Obesity, which parodied all the people taking, like, Ozempic and, like, all the other weight loss drugs. And I thought it was really funny, but it also tackles the American healthcare system and how goofy it truly is. And it's, like, pretty to a T. Like, I've dealt with the, the American healthcare system a lot, and it's, like... A doctor tells you, oh, we're going to put you on this medication. And then the insurance company's like, "Mm, we're going to try this one first. And then that one doesn't work. They're like, oh, we're going to try this one. And then that one doesn't work. They're like, well, let's try this one. It's like as if you're a a guinea pig. I mean, it's not even as if you are. You are guinea pigs in the healthcare system. They don't care about anybody. They just want to care about getting money. So I, I think it's amazing that a show like South Park is almost 30 years old and it still stays completely relevant. Mm -hmm. with each episode and and special that they put out. Hopefully there's going to be a new season this year before the end of 2024. I don't know if we will or not, but this, uh, I think, might be the first year that there won't be a season since the beginning of South Park. Wow. If they don't do a season. We've had specials and everything in between that. Mm -hmm. but So hopefully we will. That's on Paramount+. Plus. My final shout out goes to Richard Sherman, who unfortunately passed away last week at the age of 95. Uh, He and his brother, Bob, wrote tons of songs for Disney. Absolute legends. And like they did movies for the early, when I say the parent trap, I was like 1950s or something version with Haley Mills. Uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Mary Poppins, The Jungle Book, Aristocats. My favorite as a child was Winnie the Pooh, so that was like always, their music literally always part of my life. Mm -hmm. They did theme park songs like the Tiki Room, One Little Spark for Journey into Imagination with Figment. That song I'm not eh. a fan of, is that what you're about to say? You know, eh. I feel like (laughs) maybe just because... I feel, I don't know, maybe just because I heard the song so many times when I was in that ride. <laughs> what do you mean when you were, oh, well, because it repeats. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite songs. So. Really? Yeah, it's a fantastic song. I don't know. <laughs> they also did uh, both songs that would be used for my favorite attraction in Carousel Progress. Uh, Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow and Now is the Time. I think that's what the Now is the Time I think that's what it's called. Mm-hmm. And then probably their most famous song for the theme parks, at least, It's a Small World. How different these parks and movies would be without the, the music of the Sherman Brothers, I don't know what you're looking at. They also wrote that song, You're 16, which was a hit with Johnny Burnett, and then later Ringo Starr had that as a hit. But their father was a songwriter during that Tin Pan Alley era, which I think his most famous song was maybe Living in the Sunlight, Loving in the Moonlight, which it was a big hit with, with Tiny Tim, like years after. And people from maybe my generation and, and generations below us would, would probably know that song from SpongeBob. Mm-hmm. They used that. But it was their dad that influenced them to become songwriters. And like I said, the Sherman Brothers songs were literally always part of my life, despite having their songs be released decades before I was born. And I always wished that I was able to see Richard Sherman in concert. I was very jealous of anyone who was able to see that. Even, I mean, I remember it was like 15, 16 years ago, a video came out of him playing at like a day camp or something. <laughs> For like, I was, I was already like in maybe senior year or post senior year of of high school Mm -hmm. jealous of these little kids listening to him perform like Winnie the Pooh and everything live. (laughs) But, uh, I really wish I was able to see that, but I was unfortunately not able to. There's a really good documentary about the brothers. 
Uh, it was released in 2009 called The Boys, The Sherman Brothers Story. That I know is on Disney Plus, and I highly recommend that. But go listen to, go watch all those movies. Go listen to the soundtracks. Uh, those yeah. are my shout outs. Now it's time for our. our- is right our mark out moment of the week i totally marked out for gangrel during that matchup for edge uh gangrel come with the house of black gangrel coming out of the ring i thought that was epic and then him hitting the impaler on everybody I uh, I marked out so hard for that. It's so unfortunate what happened with Edge with the fractured tibia. Yeah. I mean, I I saw the clip once and I did it. I saw the clip once and then I keep on scrolling and then it would pop up. I can't I don't want to watch it again. I it's, still like I said earlier. I I don't I don't get that spot. Yeah, it, it looks like he didn't like it looked like obviously it was supposed to be a body splash. Uh, but, I was thinking elbow drop. Oh, I I didn't even think elbow drop. I thought body splash, and it, he just came down feet first. And you know, like, we've seen Sid, we've seen other wrestlers, like, we've Jim seen... Jim Cornette this... did that, too. He blew out his, I think it was both knees or something? Jeez. I mean, just in general. I mean, gymnastics, we've seen people coming down feet first. It's not good. And unfortunately, with Edge, it didn't end up being good. He fractured his tibia. So hopefully he'll have a speedy recovery, but definitely I marked out for that matchup and for Gangrel. Yeah, Gangrel being a double or nothing was unexpected, and I think it's absolutely ridiculous and stupid. If this is actually truth, I believe Edge said it, that WWE told Edge that nobody would remember Gangrel, and that's why they didn't have like a, a brood reunion with yeah, him. Yeah, awful. That's dumb because, I, I mean... Maybe we're looking at it differently. I don't know, but I've always been a fan of the Brood. I've always been oh, a yeah, fan of Gangrel. So. You know, I, I yeah. Uh, also marked out for MJF's return. Yeah. Uh, finally, he yeah. is back, and then he gets his tattoo of about AEW, but it, it could be wiped off. It could be covered up. That segment just made no sense. Yeah, um, I don't like it when they do segments like that where the appearance gets spoiled by a video like a video package i don't like that i'd well, rather I don't think i mean that's still like a surprise though i don't know it, it, it is but i don't like that because now you're like okay mjf is about to come to the ring everybody so get ready to get loud i i'd rather <laughs> i'd rather the initial theme song hit he's on the stage crowd reaction i'd rather that immediate reaction instead of the buildup of in intro as to who is coming out i don't also like that. i don't know what was that like supposed to be like a video game or something that i don't know I don't, yeah um, i don't know either but i'm yeah i marked out also for bronson reed versus otis because i mean who doesn't like the like that monday night meet you know jordan grace and ethan page being on nxt i think that's Huge. still yeah, other mark out moments. You know? Also, um, and then I mean, got it. Got to say, mark out for Liv Morgan and Dominic. Liv kissing Dominic, huge yeah. mark out moment. I mean, it was just a ton of Liv Morgan being champ, winning the championship. Even you could say the Alexa Bliss potential Alexa Bliss tease appearance. Who knows? Liv Morgan's going to show up with black hair, don't you think? Who knows? Who knows? The uh, on on Sunday night, the same time, basically that. Double or Nothing was happening. The A&E biography aired for Eddie Guerrero. And they had unaired interview footage, which I thought was cool. But even though I think we've we've already seen the, the footage that they used, I popped at them, including Sasha Banks. Mm-hmm. Because at basically the same time, she was winning the TBS championship. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, also... Not really a mark out for me, but maybe for you, Sunday, August 11th, uh, Eisenhower Park announced their free concerts this summer. Mm-hmm. It's Live in Color. That's cool. So, I don't know if you want to make plans to go <laughs> go to that or not. I don't know. No, definitely not. 
<laughs> but that is our <laughs> mark out moments of the week. That is episode 695. Thank you so much for checking us out. Check us out on Twitter at Mark and out at BTTG 161 on Twitter and Instagram. Chris Sween dog, CM Sweeney 85, David PTDPT on all platforms, facebook.com slash Mark and out YouTube and Instagram is Mark and out 11 uh, pro wrestling tees.com slash Mark and out Mark and out on TikTok. Check us out on Mark and Apple podcasts, Amazon podcast, Spotify podcast, and YouTube as well. Rate review, subscribe, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, that's listening to this. We're moving over to uh, June, and uh, we'll see you there. We wish you the, the best, best of luck in your future, future endeavors. endeavors. Have a fantastic week. <laughs>